It was simply there on one humid morning about six weeks ago. I walked out of my house, looked right on the way to my car, and there it was. A black square in the middle of the street. I thought it was a strange box or something, thinking nothing of it, and then I went off to get lunch. But it was still there when I returned, and this time, the neighborhood kids that usually collectively play in the yard to my house's left were now instead off to the right. Circled around the black square, they were talking, laughing, and poking at it with sticks. Something didn't seem right about the scene, so I got out of my car and stood for a moment watching. What was wrong here? It hit me. They weren't poking at it. They were poking into it. One of the local teenagers was sitting on the porch behind me, so I knew the kids were being looked after. If it was some strange prank or something, well, I'd hear about it later. I headed back inside and I returned to writing that day's story. Around 8 in the evening, someone began knocking on our front door. Two of my roommates were in their rooms with the doors open, but we were all playing an online game together, so we ignored it and hoped the guy in the room downstairs would get it. He either didn't hear it or he didn't care, so we sat there listening to the pounding and knocking for about 15 minutes before one of my roommates logged off the game and stormed down to the front door. I heard, What the hell do you want? None of us are parked in your goddamn spot. We never park in your spot. That didn't sound good. I left my computer and slid down the hallway to see what's going on. They told me stories about Bill and how he insisted that one section of the sidewalk was for his food truck apparently. He would go around at literally any time of the day or night knocking on every single door in the neighborhood until he found the offender. This time, Bill was not looking for the car owner, but for the perpetrator of the Black Square prank. After much arguing, he finally moved on to the next house, but I couldn't go back to playing our game. Instead, I wandered out under the evening orange and headed down the street. The black square was odd. Its angle seemed to be changing to match me and I moved my head back and forth a few times rapidly to confirm that it always looked exactly the same from any angle. Anton was sitting in his open garage in a lawn chair as I approached. He handed a man a bag and pocketed a stack of cash and coughed and leaned back. The stranger hurried away without looking at me, and this was not an unusual sight. Standing in Anton's driveway, which ran straight at the black square and Bill's house beyond, I asked, Hey, what is this thing? No idea, man, he responded but it's got me on edge. It's just been there all day. I thought maybe somebody was scoping me out, but it doesn't do anything. I didn't want to get close to it, so I picked up a stick. Kids were messing with this earlier, right? Did anything happen? Nah. It was strange. There seemed to be some sort of scaling perspective at work. As I moved closer to the square, it grew larger in my sight than the change in distance warranted. Far away, the effect had been imperceptible, but up close it was extremely unsettling. It felt almost as if the black square was looming up to encompass me and might even leap out at any moment. It was becoming increasingly obvious that this was no prank. The sides were exactly equal in length from what I could see and absolutely nothing showed or reflected on its surface. I'd seen Vanta Black nanofabric in person once before and that super black material had definitely left an impression on me. It had felt like staring into absolute void and I had that same feeling now. The only difference was that my stick encountered no resistance as I moved it forward. I took one step and the stick still moved freely ahead. Was it past the threshold yet? It was disturbingly impossible to tell because the square always seemed to be facing me, so I couldn't just tilt left or right and get a look from the side. 
The square also got bigger faster than it should have with each step, so I couldn't get a good idea of exactly where it began and ended. Worst of all, the forward perspective had no landmarks and no shadows. It felt as if I was inside a television show and reaching forward into a CGI background. The studio lights off screen were still lighting the stick and I was reaching into something that didn't really exist. I swung my branch left and right and there were no edges to strike either. The pointed end traversed from ultra black to the green of Bill's lawn and back with no resistance. It was then I truly understood that we were in trouble. Hey Anton, what up? He was usually one to play it cool, but I could tell he was concerned by the expression that he had on his face. Let's uh, how do I phrase it? Let's make sure nobody goes near this thing. He nodded and gave me a nervous laugh. We didn't have any sort of housing association or community building, so it would really be up to word of mouth. Bill was two houses past ours now, still knocking on doors, and he was doing a decent accidental job of warning everyone. A few neighbors had come out onto their lawns to stare at the thing, and I saw Idol emerging one lawn over. While studying the black square from afar, she shivered and pulled her headscarf a little closer. I smoothed out my shirt reflexively as she approached. She stopped on the sidewalk just short of Anton's driveway. What is this square? We just shook our heads. Have you called the police? She asked, looking at me. Anton leaned back in his seat and watched me. Put on the spot, all I could say was, um, I don't think so. She was visibly confused. Why not? Anton snickered. The cops don't come here, girl. Police don't come to this area? Nah, they do, but trust me, you don't want them. They don't come here to help. Oh. She looked down at the ground, then over to the black square, and then to her front door. She departed without a word. The rest of the neighborhood began to emerge from their homes as Bill pissed them off in sequence, but we did not meet or talk beyond the distant glances of confusion and confirmation. I didn't like the square in the street, not one bit, but there wasn't much to do about it. A few people were taking pictures, so I went back inside and put my phone on the charger to do the same. My roommates and I locked the house up tight that night. We couldn't see the black square from any of our windows, but the mere knowledge of its presence was like a chill in the air. I was the night owl of the four of us, and when the others went to bed, I quietly stacked boxes full of junk from the basement to block the windows, just in case. In the morning, nobody commented in approval of the boxes, but neither did they take them down. I'd seen more than my share of movies and shows about creepy anomalies, but it was another thing having one actually show up outside of my house. In person, there's the balance of risk versus curiosity, and there was nothing we could do about the square without endangering ourselves. We couldn't get too close of it because who knew what would happen, and we certainly couldn't go inside it. So it sat there, and in large part, we ignored it in our day-to-day -day lives. But there's also another kind of risk. The unknown and the stress effects on your community and on your health. Each morning for a week, I would look to my right at that eerie black square and wondered if I was being watched. Or worse, was it some kind of hole from somewhere that might let in horrific entities beyond our understanding? Or hell, even just basically clawed creatures we could understand would be pretty horrifying. A simple wolf or bear on the loose on our street would have been an emergency warranting help, and here we were with the possibility of literally anything appearing at any time. On a random night that about eight people were over to play board games, Idol asked again if I would call somebody, and this time I agreed. But who and how? I did find some numbers for two local news channels. I sent in my pictures, but they laughed at me and they said they looked photoshopped. 
I insisted that no, it was literally just a black square and they told me to call back when I had something scarier. The military was an obvious answer too, but how does one call the military? I didn't exactly have a phone number for the military and each night for a week, I waited on hold with various desks, bases, and institutions, repeating my story verbatim each time. A strange anomaly had appeared in a neighborhood and I need someone to come take a look at it. Most secretaries would hang up on me immediately, but I finally got one that laughed. He asked, Watching some X-Files tonight? Look, I've been trying to contact someone about this for a week. Let's say, hypothetically, that I'm serious. Is there some sort of division or group for that? Let me just call Area 51, buddy. They'll take care of that for you. Come on, there has to be some guy that takes weird phone calls and checks them out, right? Ah, uh, that's no fun. Fine, I'll give you the number. I had it. Finally, I had it. The next conversation I had was promising and a military jeep showed up in the next morning. Idol texted me when she saw it park on the street and I hurriedly went outside to greet only one man. He was only slightly older than me and he stood staring at the black square with a haunted gaze. As I finally got his attention he turned his head to look at me and he said, Mother fuck. Right? I pointed on the street at the black square. The thing's been sitting there for like a week and a half. Finally prompted to move he went to the back of his jeep pulled out a tripod and a camera and set it up facing the anomaly. Watching him, I asked, so you're going to call on the big guns, right? Someone's going to take care of this. His only answer was a glance and then he got in his jeep and drove off, leaving the equipment running. That was progress, I told myself. Someone was aware of the issue now and somebody was on it. Small consolation as the days wore on. One of the neighbors boarded up their windows and then everybody did. Nobody asked the first house to do it if they had seen or heard something scary. We just did it. That day we went to the hardware store, endured the awkward process of explaining what we were doing to the overly helpful employees and then we took our boxes of nails and stacks of wood and began hammering into the window frames. I winced at the first one that went already and damaged the walls but I figured our security deposit was long gone anyways. We kept the curtain between the glass and the wood so that the landlord wouldn't notice on a casual drive by, although he would certainly see that the entire neighborhood had certainly acquired bars and boards. If the area went to shit, would he lower our rent? It's doubtful. Then my roommates and I got drunk together for the first time in months. The neighbors were doing the same thing in the boarded up houses and on their lawns, and eventually we had some sort of block party going. It was an eerie thing, all being connected and bonded by a common thread, but being unable to mention that threat even as it loomed in the distance at all times. There was nothing we could do about it, so mentioning it publicly was impolite. As dust deepened and someone started a bonfire in their backyard, I almost couldn't stand the pressure of what was happening. That thing might turn deadly and kill us at any time, but I wasn't even allowed to mention it without pissing people off. Boarding up our houses, we were all reacting to it, we were all aware it existed and we all knew everyone else knew it too, but we couldn't talk about it. A weird defensiveness was emerging among the conversations I overheard. This was our street and none of us could afford to move away. Therefore, the black square had to be harmless. There were even people talking about the idea that there was nothing wrong at all. And that talk was growing. Agitated, I left the block party and I still wanted to drink but angrily now. So I went to the nearest bar and I sat. By pure chance, to the left was the soldier who'd set up the camera equipment. He was half drunk already and he looked sidelong at me while holding the bar to keep himself up. He laughed darkly. Oh, it's you. It was almost a relief to see that he was still in town. You guys going to do anything about that black square once you collect enough info? He sat taller and focused his bloodshot eyes on me. Guys. Yeah, your team or whatever. 
It's just me. Oh, well, what about the higher-ups? He downed another shot that had just been delivered. Higher-ups? My whole department got cleared out by the new administration to cut costs or something. I'm the only guy in my entire building. My beer arrived and I took a sip of it while trying to fully understand what he meant. Like, temporary? Or are you waiting on new hires? He gave an exaggerated shrug. It's been seven months and nobody talks to me or tells me anything. I just get a paycheck automatically. No emails, no nothing. I'm thinking maybe they just forgot to transfer me when they got the rest. I don't think anyone even knows that I'm still here. That was an off-putting thing to hear. Well, then what are you going to do about this black square? He gave a long, drunk belly laugh. Brother, there are 47 anomalies in Ohio alone and I'm the only person in this state left in the department that handles that shit. Just be happy that yours isn't making people crazy or changing your muscle tissue into acid while you sleep. Wait, what? Does that actually happen? He stared forward at the venue's long mirrored back wall for a moment, unmoving except for the muscles in his jaw tightening as he was grinding his teeth. After a tick, he suddenly reached over and clapped me on the back. Nothing, so dramatic is all that. I'm just playing. He got up, threw some cash in the bar, and he began to stumble away. Wait, I called after him. What's your plan for the square? Plan? He yelled back on his way out the door. You're on your own, brother. I skirted through the crowd and pushed out into the night. And what about the 46 other anomalies? He just kept walking and soon became small in the distance. Was it really possible that there was nobody manning the defenses for things like this? Were we simply open to danger with no one to respond? Was the only working plan to hope that nothing bad would happen? What the hell kind of plan was that? I returned home even more agitated than before. It was about three weeks after the appearance of the anomaly that those that insisted the black square was harmless became the majority. We'd been able to complain about it, make jokes, and watch it fearfully before that afternoon. But the winds changed and I immediately found myself on the outside with no warning. If I had glanced suspiciously at the black square, someone would deride me for it. If I tried to measure to see if it was growing at all, someone would come out on their lawn and tell me to stop and that I was wasting my time. And by the fourth week, those reactions became veiled threats. Bill was standing out on the sidewalk the first day of that fourth week. I had just come home from playing a card game somewhere else and he approached me rather angrily. Stop causing trouble, he said without sugarcoating it. Are you talking to me? He was a large man in multiple ways and I took a step back warily. I'm just not willing to accept that this incredibly odd anomaly in the middle of our street is safe. The black square isn't causing any trouble, he growled. You're the problem here. You're pissing people off and going against the grain. People want to sleep soundly and they can't do that if you fill their heads with nonsense dangers. If it is nonsense, I asked, then why are your windows boarded up? He balled a fist. Cause that's how it's always been around here. Everybody does it and always has. The hell are you talking about? It was just last month that he slugged me in the stomach. I backed away and there was nothing left to say. I understood exactly what was happening. He glared from the sidewalk until I went inside and closed the door behind me. Two mornings later, screaming erupted from a few houses down. Nine of us rushed out of our houses with makeshift weapons only to find that the danger had been the night before. Somebody's window had been broken and the wood beyond had been clawed mightily by something that had left traces of azure icor behind. I thought that certainly it would be undeniable now. It was obvious that something had come out of that black square and tried to get into a house. The only reason the single father and his two girls were alive were they boarded up their windows like everybody else. See? I said to those that gathered around, I told you it's dangerous. But the single father in question shook his head. 
Of course you'd say that. How'd you do it? I began backing away almost instantly as all the eyes turned on me. What? Bill said, Yeah, likely what happened. What tool did you use to make those marks and what was that blue shit? Is it toxic? Did you put Ethan's girls in danger by throwing toxic blue sludge onto their house? Ethan added, And you're gonna pay for that window too. What the hell is wrong with you people? I clutched my bat and I continued moving backwards. Idol came out of her house then and asked some of the others in the group what was going on in Somalia. They backed off and Bill and Ethan shot me hateful glances. On the way back to my place, Anton shook his head as I crossed his driveway. You're gonna get yourself killed, boy. Whispering, I asked. What, by insisting that the physics defy an anomaly in our street is possibly dangerous? I'm just saying, kid. I sit in the front of this thing all day, every day, and it freaks the hell out of me. But I don't say nothing to anyone else around here. The neighbors are more dangerous than that thing, get it? Just keep your head down. I mulled over his words for another few days while the attitude in the neighborhood became openly hostile. More claw marks and strange azure liquids appeared during each night, and Bill started enforcing what he called his right to open carry by walking around on the sidewalks with an automatic rifle slung over his shoulder. And then Ethan started doing it too. It may be tense as hell, but they'd often talked about gun responsibility and part of me was glad to have weapons around given that something was probably coming out of that black square each night and trying to get into our houses. At four in the morning on the first night of the fifth week, I heard a loud banging on the front door. For 20 minutes, I listened to someone pounding and yelling outside until one of my roommates shouted from his bed, Screw off, Bill. We don't have to answer the door for you. We're not parked in your spot. The knocking went silent, and my other roommate called from his room. That's the first time he's actually just gone away. At that, I sat up starkly in my bed. I knew, in that keening instant, I knew. Something had happened out there. Some spark. Perhaps the unseen creature had finally gotten someone. Perhaps it had gotten one of the neighborhood children. I grabbed my baseball bat and put on my tennis shoes, and other than that, I was only in shorts and a t-shirt, but there was no time. Running into the dark hallway that connected our rooms, I whispered, Get your gun out. What? My roommate asked. Get your goddamn gun ready, I practically hissed. They're coming for us. There was a crash of glass and the sound of boards being ripped off in the back of the house to punctuate what I'd said, and I heard my roommate jumping up and fumbling around with the case that held his gun. My other roommate just said quietly and fearfully, They're not coming for us. They're coming for you. In the dark, I heard his door close and lock. This was no movie situation, and I knew this would end very quickly between untrained civilians and... I knew I was at a big disadvantage. If the windows hadn't been boarded up, I would have escaped that way, but I was forced into a corner. I only had knowledge of the train and the advantage of surprise. Using long steps to avoid the parts of the floor that creaked, I moved out into the big board game room and a big silhouette moved around the corner became a wide open target for my bat. I swung without restraint and as hard as I could. I never tried to kill anyone before, but I was amazed at how lethal my strength felt when the restraints were off. The bat snapped in half on Bill's head and he fell to the floor. He limply tried to resist but I pulled at the rifle while screaming obscenities and he gave it up while groaning on the floor and whimpering about his head bleeding. I had won. But unfortunately, there were seven more silhouettes behind him and Ethan was among them and I saw his face by moonlight as they dragged me out onto the street. This asshole nearly killed Bill, he shouted. Proof positive he's the one behind the attacks. You came into my house with guns, I screamed at them. You guys are psychopaths. There were nearly 20 other people out there already, mainly sticking to their own lawns. By the light of the full moon, they watched fearfully. Some of them asked if what I was saying was the truth. But Ethan yelled over them, he'll say anything to trick you people. It's fake news. Fake. They were still holding my arms, but I struggled. This is ridiculous. You've got all the guns and you literally just broke into my house in the middle of the night. 
fake lies. Ethan insisted to the neighbors we passed as they kept pushing me and dragging me. As we passed Idol on her lawn, I realized where we were going. She ran forward and kicked at Ethan. I did not leave my country just for you to be the same. One of the men stayed behind to keep her restrained and I nearly got away because of the distraction. But unfortunately they caught me and continued moving me towards the black square. Even by moonlight, it was starkly visible. Why are you doing this? Ethan snarled. You know, you monster. I can't let you live after what you did to my little girl. I could see one of the wooden barricades among his windows had failed. Someone had broken its way inside, and red blood was mixed with the azure pools usually left behind. So your plan is to kill me by throwing me inside the black square? I asked loudly that everybody could hear. How does that make any sense if you insist it's not dangerous? That I'm the one who somehow orchestrated these attacks in the night. One of the neighbors screamed, Stop trying to get out of this. She turned and insisted to someone else that I was a liar. Getting rid of him will stop the attacks. And they were lost. I'd known it. But it was only now that I truly accepted that I was not in a neighborhood surrounded by peers. I'd been living in a hostile territory surrounded by enemies for weeks and they'd become delusional because of their own fear. Living with fear every single day and being unable to do anything about it has turned their fear to anger. And now anger had become violence directed at the only target they could actually reach. Their own neighbor. On that first night of the fifth week, they kicked me forward and pointed their guns at me, forcing me to walk into the black square, the unknown source of their fear. It had come to us from somewhere else, but it was now the desperate void at the center of our lives. It was our heart. I never felt more sharp and aware. Adrenaline seared fire through my every nerve as I kept moving away from the guns at my back. The dark square expanding rapidly in my sight, but then grew more slowly as I came nearer than ever before. It filled half of my sphere of what I could see. I kept waiting to pass the threshold like a door, to see the sides I had tried to find with sticks and ropes over the last five weeks, but it never came. I kept pressing forward only to find myself still half in the world I knew and half in the darkness, until I turned around and saw Ethan and the others were very far behind me. My brain struggled to process the shape or curve of what was happening, but I had the distinct sensation that I could keep walking forever and the black square would remain a giant sail pressed against half of me. Except I knew there was an unseen drop off and perhaps that was the key. Perhaps the door was actually down and the black square we could perceive was merely a higher dimensional perspective on it. I got down on my knees and hands and began to crawl. I couldn't afford to fall accidentally. Don't bother, Ethan shouted in the distance. You're going over and you're not getting out of this. And there it was. I could feel the edge. Here, the black square was almost exactly half of what I could see around me. Directly above, to the left, to the right, and down. The paved street far beyond Bill's and Anton's house. Part of the street I'd stood upon many times coming in the other direction. Now met sheer void. But it wasn't dark. Light had always been coming up from below. There'd just been nothing for it to reflect from so that we could see it. Light came up from below now, illuminating my face and my eyes and my mind. It was a ghastly sight. Certainly not even a color that had graced our world before. And I could see everything by the cast of its deep glare. I'd never seen that color with the rods or cones in my eye before, but I knew what it was. If you could open a door into the mind and observe the hues within. If you open that door into the mind of a person being tortured with perfect and exacting skill, you would see the chroma of pain. Not just the feeling of it or the idea of it in thought, but the blood of the concept, the core, as a brushstroke on existence. For some reason I laughed, but I did not smile. I stood and began to walk back. 
Ethan held his assault rifle forward. Don't you come back here. Don't do it. I just shook my head. The other men behind him raised their guns too, but they were waiting on him. I didn't slow. I couldn't. And as I moved towards Ethan, I told him, You're human, Ethan. You're fundamentally capable of good, or just neutrality, of cooperation, of peace. The words spilled directly from my raw brain into the night air. You are not like what's over the edge. Take a look for yourself. You'll understand. The barrel of his weapon glimmered darkly by moonlight, but the square behind me was blacker. What do you mean? He asked after a moment, the strain of oncoming terror dampening his tone. I think he saw the look in my eyes. Some fraction of what I'd seen had to still have been lingering in my irises like a rotting reflection gone bad. What's in there? What's over that edge? I couldn't really think at that moment. I put my forehead to the barrel of his rifle and grasped for the trigger under his hands. Please. He pulled away in fear. You're crazy. They were no longer a threat now and I drifted past them and back to my house, where one of my roommates peered out of his door and apologized and the other finally finished finding his ammunition. The danger's past. Don't bother. I murmured before going into my room and sitting on my bed. It took six days for my brain to develop a coping mechanism. For six days, I sat and stared at any blank white wall I could find. It was eye bleached in a way, but it had every color and none. After six days, I found nothing and that was my release. To scab and scar over what had happened to my mind. My brain had amputated my emotions. And good for that. I would feel horrible at the loss of love and joy and friendship and companionship. But I can't. And that's better than feeling what I witnessed over that edge. Bill was back from the hospital by then and feeling rather sheepish. A neighborhood watch had been set up and armed men were taking turns guarding the square, around which they'd built a wall out of bricks and cement. They knew that nobody would be coming to help. No police, no military, and no government. We were on our own. A fact which made Idol sad as she talked to me about the home she'd left where it had been exactly the same in her village. This is humans, I told her. Sometimes we do better, for a little while, and sometimes we don't. She didn't have a chance to reply before Bill came up and sat carefully down next to me on the porch. He rubbed his bandaged hand and said, Sorry about what happened last week. I kept watching my armed neighbors around the black square. It doesn't matter. It does though, he muttered, looking downcast. We could have killed you. It doesn't matter, I said again. He swallowed audibly and then asked, What'd you see in there, and do you think the neighborhood's gonna go to shit now? Now? It amazed me that it was right there. It was right there, just a hundred feet away. We were alive and standing here breathing air and eating food and having conversations just a hundred feet away from that. It was always here, Bill. The only thing that changed six weeks ago is that we can see it now. We don't talk much anymore and the neighborhood is quieter than before. We just sit and wait for the inevitable each day and each night. The black pit is among us, lurking in open sight and... One day it'll spill forth ungodly hordes and I don't need to describe because you already know what they look like. Sometimes we do better, but sometimes we don't.